Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, this is Virtual Tourism um, with me, Tassie Gennady, and um, I'm the manager of the cyber infrastructure for um, digital humanities and creative activities. <laughs> I now have to think even more than I used to have to think when I say my title, um, which is part of research technologies um, at UITS. And this is Matt Mercer, who um, helped me to build this tour, actually not help me, I helped him um, with this tour. He did most of the work um, and he's part of our group. Um, so this tour that you're, you're, we'll be focusing on today, we'll be talking about sort of multiple technologies that are available, um, multiple modes of building tours or the things that go into tours. Um, and we'll also show some other methods of virtual tourism and then we can address maybe some of your concerns at the very end. Um, but um, this was done in, in partnership um, with the Indiana Geological and Water Society. Um, they do a limestone tour in person. Um, so every semester, or not every semester, they do it sort of on demand. And it's about a two hour tour. And so there are multiple affordances um, that you have to be able to stand or walk for two hours to be able to go on this tour. I mean, I guess you could go on it in a wheelchair if you couldn't walk. Um, hi, thanks for coming. Um, but um, I know for me, um, I have plantar fasciitis and my feet really hurt at the end of it. <laughs> also, clearly, you have to be on the campus of IU to be able to go on the in-person um, limestone tour. Um, and so it may be the alumni or other folks who, are, who might be coming to campus. We've often seen like preview tourism where people will look at places they're going to go. Um, and then we wanted to also show um, some places may not be super accessible. Um, so this is obviously IU is accessible, but there may be places like quarries that are not open to the public. Um, and so we were able to demo this at the um, Geological Society meeting um, in Indianapolis this, this uh, fall, um, and that was really cool. So you can see here, um, this is uh, Maxwell Hall, um, and you can see this is an entry coil with the serpent, which was one of my favorite sort of features um, of this building in particular. Um, and we'll show you more later when we actually brought cardboards and stuff. Um, this is actually one of the older buildings. Um, and so you can actually see these holes in the limestone here are from where they quarried it. I've got the expert here in case I don't say it quite right. And they pulled it out. Um, so these are like original quarry marks, that you, which means the limestone was sort of cut much earlier than some of the older or newer buildings. Um, and then it's also brick, which is how you can tell that it's one of the older buildings. Um, and the reclaimed brick is important um, because these are some of the only remnants of the old campus in, that was at Seminary Square. Um, so originally IU was not over here. Um, and then this is one of the ones you can see, um, this is Wiley before the fire, and then this is Wiley <laughs> during the fire. <laughs> um, so, um, so I always, I thought that was really interesting because it, it gives you this piece of history um, that you can talk about the fire on the physical tour, but here you can actually show these historical photos um, as part of it. And then finally here, again, you sort of have a historical photo um, and then you can also have details that you might not be able to see very well in person just because of the height, right, um, where they are. Um, so with that, um, we will, flip over to um, our PowerPoint and I will let um, Matt sort of, we're gonna come back to this at the end actually. Um, so I will give it over to Matt. I didn't realize they were all fancy fly-ins. So, um, well, basically with this presentation, I'm trying to explain like everything that we've, everything that me and Tassie have worked on when it came to like virtual tours and like all the thought thinking of it and like the actual doing and like, just like everything that went into it, the planning, the capturing, the post-processing and then creating the tour, which I used Google Poly because that seemed like the easier uh, option for us. And I think it's more accessible for most people. So. I'm just gonna get right into it. 
So what is a 360 tour? It's more like, so a 360 tour is basically using 360 photos and or video to like capture a simulation of a location that you might want to capture deciding, to, thinking of what you would think would be like a good thing that might need to get simulated or not, not as accessible as you would want it to be. Then you can also use multimedia features such as audio, text, and other static photos within the photosphere. And then 360 tours can be viewed in the computers, phones, and uh, virtual reality devices, which I usually call them HMDs, which are head-mounted devices. And what are some uses of the 360 tour? Well, academic research, historic preservation, prototyping, tourism, real estate, marketing. And like to explain that a little, go further with all these, it's, it really depends on the person and what their ideas are when it comes to deciding what uses they wanna do for these 360 tours and this virtual tour, tourism. And like, if you're more on the academic side, you're obviously gonna do like academic research or you might even do like the historic preservation like we were, that's kind of like what we kind of did with the, with the tour, having some historic like background on it, but also having a little, uh, some tourism and like for those people that can't get to the campus. Well, how I used the tour or what tour uh, program I used was Google Tour Creator. And it's pretty easy to access and it's free and you don't have to download anything. You just simply need a Google account. And it doesn't really require any like coding. You just drag and drop and you can get everything on there. Like you can get your pictures on there. You can get the photos for your 360 photos on there. And it's super easy to edit, publish, and share. Now there are a lot of limit or like a few limitations when it comes to using Google Tour Creator, including you can only use smartphone viewers to view in VR. You can't use like a, a Vive or an Oculus to use it because they're not really compatible with like Google Google and like Google Expeditions and Google Poly, which Google Poly was doesn't even really have an app. You can only go on the website. But since we were able to get our tour onto Google Expeditions, we're able to use it more on like these. Well, we can use them on cardboards, but it's easier to use them on Google Expeditions while using those cardboards because we can configure them with the HMDs. And then some limited features are like you can't have web links on your tour. You can't have web like have a map in the tour and you can't have like a location hotspot where you can like press over to that area and you can go to that area. You can't do that in the Google tour creator. And it only accepts JPEGs and PNGs. And then the audio it only accepts is MP3. And something we uh, realize is that you can only change the, uh, <laughs> you cannot change the um, cover photo that you want representing your tour on Google Poly. So really think of what you want to have your cover photo as and stick with it and you won't have any problems. <laughs> now, when it comes to like planning my tour, I want to start with like identifying what I want to do with my tour, why I want to do this tour and how it might be exciting or like entertaining or interesting to the audience. And so we think about like these things, like why, why is this important? Why is it significant to you all? Like, of course we're making it and trying to think why it would be important to us, but really we're trying to think why is it important to whoever we're showing it to and like what message we're trying to show. And then we brainstorm these ideas and think of what locations you guys would think would think be a, would be great to capture and be interesting to, be shown in a full 360 tour. And then you think about 
more detailed things like is it indoor is this the outdoors and you always had to think about all that because that's going to be important when i'm capturing the actual photo the photospheres and those different things you always plan for weather when it's outdoors because if there's too mo too much clouds then the capture might look bland and kind of dead and i mean that's great for photogrammetry but that's not really good when you're trying to show what's so beautiful about that location what's so exciting about that location so if you have too many clouds that might not be too great for that photosphere but also if you have too much light there might be a problem with the glare or like these red dots which actually i started to learn as i was take, starting to take more photospheres is that when the sun's hitting the like beaming at the uh, lenses of the 360 uh, cameras there's actually like red dots that might like reflect off and you might see it in the photosphere and that kind of like just doesn't look good and then if you're indoors you just got to think about your surroundings and the distractions around you you don't you don't put a camera on the wall or you don't or you don't put the camera by the wall you try to like put it in like that open area and you try to keep it away from any like columns or like if you see people walking past that's not going to be a you got to really like think when do I capture this without people being in <laughs> like there was there was actually like a guy like walking past one of my captures once and he was just like looking at my camera and I was like um can I help you and he was like oh are you in the media school and I'm like no can you get away from my camera <laughs> so that that these are the problems that you got to think about so you can't be too you have to be you have to be aware of everything <laughs> And then when you're planning these scenes, you also think about what are you gonna put, what, what insets, what other things are you gonna put into the tour to make it pop, make it convey that message that you're trying to show to the audience. And like what text and what descriptions, everything that you wanna be shown in this, uh, in that one particular scene in the full tour. Because I think it's like, it's a really about just creating a story it's always about creating a story when it comes to a virtual tour and not like there's, there's a difference between a tour and a gallery. If it's a gallery, it's just a collection of photos and photospheres. But if it's a tour, you're trying to create something, you're trying to tell something. It's, it's more than what you want. It's more than a gallery. So this is a spreadsheet that we worked with um, the geological society that they identified sites for us and gave us information and um, so we really made sure that it was going to highlight the kinds of information that we needed to, to, um, to portray sort of really that this was a geological tour, not just simply a, hey, let's walk around by museum. And when it comes to like deciding on the text and for the scene, obviously, as I've said, it makes it, it can be an important and an entertaining part of the tour when you have this descriptions and you have these extra like insets text insets that explain more about why why is that picture there why is these why, why is all these things right there and what makes that tour important to the whole or what what makes that scene more important in this whole tour and every photo should have text like captions and descriptions or titles i mean obviously at least titles <laughs> so you know what the photosphere is and then describing what the scene is can be helpful to show the audience the details that they may not have been paying attention when you don't realize that there's something that's actually important there and then it explains this is why that's important that really helps and just explaining the photo the photosphere and the big picture of things and then when it comes to insets, the audio, the extra photos that are within this, the actual scene, it could, be, it could be helpful and it can add more insight to like what details are in the scene. And it kind of makes it more realistic. It gives it a more realistic experience as you, when you're in that tour. And having, when it comes to uh, static images, Images can be used to portray what is being said in the text about the scene. So, I mean, you could still, like, 
of course, texts are important, but if you have an image that even adds more to that text, that just really helps with the, the whole experience of the virtual tour. And then it can also show things that you might have not been able to see at all, and it just pops out at you, and you're like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's something I didn't even see. And now that you've shown that, and you, you gave that, that significance, that emphasis on that part of that, the part of that scene, then you, oh yeah, like the out. So like, like let's say there, so there's a picture. So we took a scene of Brian Hall and on Brian Hall in the, we took a picture in front of Brian Hall, but on the side of Brian Hall, there's actually an owl, but you can't see the owl in the tour. So what we did is we put the picture of the owl kind of on the corner so you could see it. And it like you've pressed the button, you can actually see the owl. And funny thing about owls is it's the most, uh, what was it, the most? Yeah, so I have 13 different species. Yeah, so I have 13 stone owls on And the most use grip or rough? The most, other than the IU logo, the pride and rose, they use the most common. Yeah, the most common things on the building. That's, that's insane. <laughs> But yeah, that, that's, these are the things that help and add to the whole experience of the tour. And it's just a help. So there's another visual aid in the tour. And then audio, I, something I actually thought about, I'm pretty proud of, was that when we used audio, we, like, they, like on Google Tour Creator, they use it either as like narration, which we tried narration at first, but my voice is kind of weird. <laughs> But and, and that, but we also thought about maybe having that ambiance and like having the sounds of the environment to even make it more realistic. And when we did that, like, let's say I went to uh, the student building and we had, there's that bell tower that goes off every 15 minutes. And so one day I recorded the bell tower and actually added the sound to the tour. And so you, now we can hear the bell tower if you, press or actually I think it's if you just go on to that part of the scene you can hear the bell tower and it plays and that's super cool to me I think that's really cool so these are the things that you can add when you have these decide on these insets and you think about these scenes oh I don't think so yeah. so let's get into like really capturing the scene and actually capturing the photospheres itself and it, really, it's, it's about affordability, but also how much you want to put into this uh, tour when it comes to choosing the camera. Now, if, you're, if you would want to get into a, like a cheaper option, and you, it's, the, I think the like Theta is a really good camera and a really good starting camera for those that don't really understand taking capturing 360 pictures it was super easy when i first started and it it's just like a good easy click and you move on to the next spot but yeah it's super small and actually i think i still have it <laughs> i have my have mine and then yeah. and then there's the uh the views camera which has uh, eight lenses and it has, actually does more higher resolution. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about that more and what the views and also the Insta360 Pro, which is a very expensive, but awesome and amazing camera. <laughs> and has like a lot of great, I mean, they all are pretty great cameras too. I thought they've all worked and done the job that they've need, they need to do. So when it comes to Ricoh Theta, which is under $200, it has two lenses. It captures everything. <laughs> I'm just gonna flip right through. But like the thing that's like pretty cool is it does do 1080p HD resolution. So it does have great resolution. It's not like not good, res like it's pretty, it's pretty good for when it, when it comes to actually taking the photos and stuff. But it does only take monoscopic like 2D photos. So if you want to actually have like those 3D photos and be able to like see them in like a 3D fashion, the Theta is not able to do so. 
but when it comes to the views, like I said, eight lenses, so that's a better field of view. You're able to get a more like realistic amount of 360 when it comes to using the views. And it's also stereoscopic, so you get the 3D capture 4k so the resolution's a little bit better <laughs> a little, little 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 better so that also helps and then when it comes to the insta 360 the the, the great insta 360 which is over a thousand dollars okay yeah because that's in the way the dash all right I'm moving. all right cool and so that's well, it's $3,500, but, <laughs> but uh, six lenses and 4K and 8K, it can, or it can get up to 8K resolution for photos and videos. And then you have the option to use either monoscopic or stereoscopic. It just depends on what you feel is more important for the tour or not. And then when you're actually taking the photos, when you're using tripods, you really should think, this is just like normal photography type, type of like thinking is just like making sure that it's like kind of at like a human height or like at like an average human height, like not as tall as me, but like kind of like chest level at around like five feet to even like, even, even though it says five, five, around like five, six, five, seven. And then you just get out of the photosphere, like stay, like you can't be in that. Like, don't be in the photosphere. <laughs> and then, like, you keep a good distance. How do you get out of the photosphere? Oh, from, like, hiding or, like, looking. When you're... How do you trigger the camera? For someone who knows. Yeah. So, how, how, how do you... Uh, Tassie asked, how do you trigger the camera or how do you get out of the way of the photosphere? And basically what I did, which I learned, is... Um, well, so when I was using the Instas 360 Pro, I would, I was using it, like I'd take pictures on a tablet. And so taking pictures on a tablet, that means like I would have to connect the Wi-Fi to the camera, but I could only go so far. So, and, but also I needed to hide and sometimes there wasn't a tree around or there wasn't like a door around. So <laughs> sometimes it, it really depends on like, you gotta feel your way out with that. And sometimes like, so, on a normal circumstance, you would go to a tree and go behind the tree and then just take the picture if you're close enough to the camera. And then you just wait till it clicks and then it, you go back and move it to the next scene. But if it's not that easy, then you can actually set a timer and you can go run somewhere <laughs> wherever you need. This is, this is from experience. Uh, it does not. <laughs> well, I mean, there is like you can click it, but that's you would be right in front of the camera. <laughs> and then, yeah, like I said earlier, try not to like have it blocked by any walls or like really like like you shouldn't have the lens like close to anything. Like it should have be like a couple like feet away or a couple like meters away from everything. And then be aware of that environment, the lighting. Like I said, the too many clouds would make it bland, and too many, too much light would make it have too much glare or those red dots. And then really, and then think about like exposure and lighting settings when you are outside. If even if there's like a good amount of light and there's like a good amount of clouds, you still have to deal with is it too bright still or is it too dark? And so you got if you you can actually go on like, like on the Insta360 Pro, you can actually go onto the, uh, you, can, you can go onto the tablet and check the exposure and see, is this perfect for what they can see and can they see everything? And so that's really important, just knowing that you can't, you do have those options. And then, like I said, find a place like a tree or a, inside the building and just hide for a couple seconds until the picture is taken and then you run back and do your thing. Continue. Yes. Do you know, is there for some of the more expensive ones like a HDR high definition or high dynamic range or other uh, option? I don't know if it's available. All right. 
the question was, is there a, a HDR or a high definition range? Oh, high, de high dynamic range. Sorry, <laughs> you're fine. Uh, yes, there is actually. So you can actually set it into being a, to, into HDR, at least for the Insta360 Pro, you can, you can switch it to HDR and get that, uh, if you, if you prefer HDR, then yes, you can do that. Being used to take the photo. Yeah. And so, yeah, it just, you got to feel it out. You got to know where is the connection range here? Like how far can I go? How close do I want to be? And that's just knowing your camera and figuring out the device and knowing where to hide. And you just, it's being, you got to be very aware when you're taking these photos and then take the photo. <laughs> and so this is kind of an example of like, kind of what I mean by like being aware and knowing where to, and how to have the tripod and where you should be. So this is, there's the camera and then if you see in the far the camera's there and that's a good range of around where i can like be away from the camera and like this is a tree that i use to hide of course because i don't want to be in the photosphere so that 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 is kind of like what i've been describing and the lighting lighting is pretty good for that day like there was not too many there was not a, like it wasn't all cloud coverage, but it wasn't too bright either. And so also even thinking about like, should I put in a shadow? Cause that also might help with like getting away from that glare or not. So it's just all those, like all those aspects and thinking of all the settings and even changing your settings and stuff like that goes into like just taking the photosphere. Uh, he asked if you can uh, duck down under the tripod. Yeah, yeah, you can. Cause you, if you if you want to, you can do that. I've not done that. I don't know why I haven't thought of that, but <laughs> that that'd be. It's funny, but it, it'd work. Uh, I'm gonna steal it. Okay. So the other thing you can do um, with a Rico Theta. Um, I've always joked that it, it's the only acceptable use of a selfie stick I've ever heard of um, because I hold it up normally when I'm traveling um, and Eric too and we both have, so I have a lot of my thumb in my pictures um, but with this one there is at the very underneath the tripod there's this blurry spot in the stitch and so yeah like I think if you were like really able you know, if you fit under there or you could um, we put a patch um, there um, that actually had for the Indiana um, Geological and Water Survey and then we had a picture of Indiana. So maybe you just make a patch a little bit bigger <laughs> to cover you. So. And so now you're going into post-processing. Once you got all your scenes, all their the all the photos have been taken, you go into post-processing and see what you need to finish up just to just. Can you repeat? Can you repeat? Yeah. He was asking if the camera is just for photos or for videos, and it actually can do both. And so once you're, once you've gone, you start uploading your, um, your photos to your, you start uploading it to your computer using either the SD card, which comes into, comes in, well, for like the theta, it doesn't come in. So you just have to like, put the th theta over there and then if it's the SD card it's you put it in there and then you put them in the folder with a pre-established naming convention very important <laughs> and then if you have box which I'm guessing most of us use box then you put it into box as a back 
back up. And then depending on your camera, you would either have to use the step of actually stitching the photospheres and like, cause they don't all come just as the 360 as once, except the theta, which it just stitches for itself, it auto stitches. And since they were just different lenses, so you had to stitch all the lenses together so it becomes a 360 thing. And then, yeah, like I said, it automatically stitches into a photosphere. And then for cameras like the Insta360 Pro, each photo from each lens is put into a folder and you have to download a stitcher that is provided by these cameras. And so then that goes into like actually stitching it. And then once those are like, once you've done the stitching and done all that, then you go into like Photoshop to clean up the lighting issues that you like might've forgot, like the red dots, or you might've had a little bit of glare or something like that. And then people maybe just being looking at your camera or something like <laughs> And then if that can't be fixed, if you've like messed up a little too much, then you just had to go out back out and retake it. And the try like, there will be, you will have to remove the tripod from the tripod from the bottom. So when they're looking down, they don't just see a tripod there or like a blurry kind of iffy looking tripod. So if you go into Photoshop, you can actually like erase that from or kind of like uh, mask it and make it look like it's actually part of like, let's say there's a sidewalk and like the tripod was sitting on the sidewalk. You can actually like make it look like the sidewalk is there there so that's really cool so it looks like it's floating and then you save everything and then you save it as either a jpeg or a png because google uh, tour creator can only take uh, jpegs or pngs and so here's the my my favorite part is actually creating the tour in google tour creator and so you start by just pressing create or the new tour and in, uh, tour, in Google Tour Creator. And when you press new tour on the top slightly uh, left corner, it will ask to make a title, description, category, cover photo. Very important to know what your cover photo is because it can't be changed after you leave that page. Yay. <laughs> That's so damn. Yeah. Especially all when it comes down to <laughs> And once that is finished, then they'll ask for the scenes that you actually need to upload. And this is where the photospheres will actually be uploaded. Also making sure reminding you that you have to be, it has to be a JPG, a JPEG, or a PNG. And then continue to press and add scene, continue adding scenes until you're done with all the scenes that you want in this tour. And this is kind of like an example of what it looks like. And so that top right hand corner on the right uh, picture, you can keep pressing it and they'll keep, you'll keep adding, or you can just press add scene right there. But if you want to uh, change the scene that you have there, like you might've added a patch or you might've added something more into it, then you can press that and you can, you can continue like changing your photosphere if you want to. And these are some of the like scene features that they have on the main part of the, uh, Google tour creator that you can add to it, like the title, where it was made, the description that you want to add for it. And maybe like you want to give credit to yourself. <laughs> you can add the ambiance for it. And then you can add scene narration. Both have to be MP3 files. And then you go into more like the specifics, those insets I was talking about earlier by using the points of interest. Yes. Um, he asked if you, the audio loops and the audio actually, um, I think, yeah, the audio does loop, but it starts out, I think it automatically is off. So you have to turn it on yourself. I think you're right. Maybe you are right. <laughs> so it's automatically on and then it turns off. You can turn it off. But yeah, this is, this is exactly or example of what the scene features look like: the title, location, the credits. Oh, also, uh, sorry, I missed. Uh, uh, Chelsea asked a question. Yes, but st st 
stitching software you use or would recommend? Okay. Um, Chelsea asking what stitching software I used or would recommend. So using the Insta360 Pro, they actually gave us a stitching software that we could use or that we used. I think it was actually it was recommended or required to use for that. Uh, for that. And with the Rico Theta, I believe there, it was automatically stitched, so you didn't have to stitch it. And then for the Views camera, I believe that you have to go into a actual – does Views have a stitcher? Yeah, then Views has a stitcher as well. But I think there is a way – there's stitching softwares just in case you are using another 360 camera. I believe uh, – is it maybe somewhere in Adobe or like Adobe Premiere maybe or – Well, if you're using an Insta360 Pro, that's Insta360, they give you a stitcher. I think most cameras have a, the stitcher. Have a stitcher that goes with them. Yeah, most cameras have a stitcher that goes with them. And so when it comes to the points of interest, and this is basically like doing the scene feature, it's like the scene features just for this those one insets. So they have the title, the description that you want to add for it. And then you can add an image, like a, a static image, a site, and then site narration. And that's what it would look like. So it looks like it's quarter to four. I have no idea what, what the bell is actually ringing. <laughs> right. And then once you have it all, like you've edited everything and you feel like I'm ready to show everybody. This is how you publish a tour. You press publish, and before it is published, it asks, do you want it to go public, or do you want it to be unlisted, and you're only able to send it to people that you want to see it? Why would you use unlisted? Uh, why would you use unlisted? Because some people might not want it to be out there yet, and so you just want to show like maybe colleagues or people that you're collaborating with before you show the public because it might there might be something that they want to see or want to see changed. And once it's published, either way, they're going to give you the link and you'll have the option to be able to look at it for yourself. And the publish button be on the top right hand corner. There's the they have the drop down for the visibility. And then there's the link. And this is how it would look on the desktop, like a tour. It would look on the desktop or on the mobile if it's non-VR. So they would have the descriptions and the point that, that can be viewed pressing on the bottom of the right-hand corner of the tour screen. And then they all can be clicked. And like it's it's and also you can click and drag on the scene to move around. And then you can click on the icon in the top right hand corner to go full screen. Click from scene using the arrows on the sides. And so that, that's basically a screenshot of what, the, uh, what a desktop in a mobile non VR would look like for a Google Poly. Oh, actually, so basically, this, this photosphere right here is within the Rosewell house. And we made it a, it was kind of like a welcome screen for the tour. And so we're going to show you a little bit more of the tour later. But basically, we, uh, I photoshopped like a collage of some of the older pictures in, uh, at IU and on IU's campus. And then I showed some of uh, the stone, like there's a map on the other side of the stone belt. There's like a picture of the fossils that are like embedded in the limestone and then also the uh, strato, stratigraphic column basically showing like where the limestone is coming from out of the ground and stuff like that. So that was, it was super cool to add on to. So that's other things you can do in Photoshop. And that's something I decided and me and Tassie decided were, was a good option for uh, adding to this tour. Right. I'll get to do that. They have the pictures not with the so you would set those in Photoshop, not in Google Poly. 
I, yeah, I set those in Photoshop. So, um, so how difficult it was to have it not warp in the photosphere. I think it was, it wasn't too hard. I mean, at first, like, it was just kind of like, Photoshop makes it really easy to like, make sure it like looks like it's part of the tour. So, or make it sure it's part of the photosphere or part of the picture. So once I like, I think it was like you had to merge it down or something like that. It just like kind of just stayed there and it doesn't really look too weird. Or it looks like fluid with the whole thing. Is so. Uh, yes, there is a 360 mode you have to be in. Like that's the that, okay. In Photoshop, in Photoshop. yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, you don't have to, sorry. Um, so you don't have to deal with the warping. There's a mode in Photoshop that once you're in it, takes care of the fact that it knows that this is going to end up being a 360 degree panorama. So you don't have to do fancy math. Yes. Yes. And so then when you, if you're using a Google Park Cardboard, which I have Google Cardboards out for you guys to look at after this presentation, it, uh, it's basically the only HMD, the head mounted display of VR visual device that you can use for Google Poly. And now that we have it on Google Expeditions, Google Expeditions. And basically how you kind of navigate it, interact is using this, this right hand corner button that they have on the uh, cardboards to like look at the points of interest to navigate through the tour. And that's, and using a, and you're able to click on these things also with focusing using the, uh, this little beam right here or dot beam. We still are indecisive on the name of it, but <laughs> it's either a dot or a beam. And it basically like is how you select things on a Google Cardboard. Now I'm gonna pass it to Tess. <laughs> Um, so I actually want to go really quickly. Um, so we did use Google Poly for a couple of reasons. There are more complicated tour creators out there. The one that we had actually wanted to use um, was recently bought by, I can't remember, when, by GoPro um, and then discontinued, abruptly discontinued. So um, that made us a little bit sad. So there are tours where maybe you have branching options and that's something that we might wanna do in the future. So Google Poly is a linear tour. I can't go to Brian Hall and then say that I wanna do two different things from there. So, um, but one of the things we liked about Poly was that it really is public in the sense that people can find it um, very easily because it's on a Google platform. Um, so we really were balancing sort of restrictions with you know, visibility, ease of access, the fact that it comes out right away and it's available for a desktop, a mobile device, and the Google Cardboards um, without us having to adapt for those three different modalities. Um, so those were, those are important considerations for us. These are some of the other examples here. Um, we've talked a little bit about Google tour, um, versus Google expedition. The difference here is Google, um, Google tours are on poly, which are on the web. You have to have web app access to be able to get to them. Um, expeditions are something you can pre download to a phone. So if you're somewhere where your, uh, internet access might be spotty or you don't want to worry about like, or where the internet may not be very strong. Um, you can pre-download those tours or those expeditions and it'll live natively on the phone. Um, so this is Versailles, which is one of the options that they have here. And you can see the Hall of Mirrors um, with the description of it. And you can also see the Orangerie and the Flower Parterre. 
Um, and I think this is a great example of when you might want to sort of pre-tourism or post-tourism, like if you, I think that a lot of folks like before they go visit somewhere like to see it, or it is possible that like you don't have the money to fly to France. Um, and so you want to experience Versailles and it may be something that's not going to happen. I know my mother hasn't been back to France in 40 years and she misses it and I showed this to her and she was really excited about it. Um, so, and then I, I'm going to go way back to the beginning of the presentation because we moved the other one that I want to show you. So, um, this is Gombe National Park. Tanzania um, and it's a little bit hard so the down sampling this can be something that happens um, so you can see right here this is um, a chimp with a baby on its back um, and um, this is where Jane Goodall spent uh, most of her life doing her research um, and so this is somewhere I would absolutely love to go but maybe we'll never make it um, and uh, so you know, I think that you get to, to see here, though, you could also use how you could use this in a class, right, or somewhere where you're going to be teaching. So you'll notice in the second screen here um, that it says beginner question, how long do baby chimps stay with their mothers, right? Intermediate question. So this is clearly meant to be a teaching device. Um, and once something is published to Google Expedition, the one extra thing um, that you have access to is actually if you have a tablet that's on the same Wi-Fi system as the phones, you can take over a tour and you can control what everybody else is seeing. So that therefore, like if you've got students who are all in this experience, and especially with people who are new to VR, sometimes they, they have a hard time finding that beam or that ray to click through the scenes or um, if you've got a class of kids because we all know kids are always perfectly behaved they might all be going like nine different places you can sort of guide them through what you want them to see first and then maybe let them explore at the end um, so there's like a coral reef tour that's like that as well um, and then here you've got monkeys on the beach um, and you can see them and again they've got questions and like why are the baboons on the beach Know, maybe they were hot they need to go swimming I, <laughs> I should have looked up the answers to this um, so uh, there are a couple thousand I think tours some of them are okay some of them are not so good there's a and then there's probably a hundred or so expeditions out there at the moment um, so yeah oh, that would be amazing um, you can see like how often they've been accessed Oh, I'm sorry, is there a rating system? Um, so let me go out to you. So um, you can see that this has 617 views. We have four likes. Maybe we need more likes, you guys. So, like, get on there and like us some more. Um, <laughs> um, so you could probably see, like, what the most liked tour is, I think. And we'll go to the search in a minute. Um, so this again is the photosphere that Matt was talking about um, and it's got this welcome text here and then also these insets even um, here you're what you're seeing are the different architectural styles that are on campus um, so you'll see that the text to the left changes um, and then he was talking about the fossils that are available um, and again uh, it talks about Salem limestone and it was deposited 340 million years ago in a shallow tropical sea. So back when there was a shallow tropical sea here. So here's our um, famous sample gates. And this is, this is a drawing of before they made the sample gates because of course they're only from 1987, so they're not that old. Um, and then also something that you can't really see in this photosphere is the insets of the plaques. So again, we made avail that available to you. Um, actually, one of my favorite insets, which maybe just shows that I'm a nerd. Um, so this, oh, it's the next one, sorry. This is one of our few that has, if you click here, um, it shows you rustification, which was actually, um, I love this detail that you shared with us, um, which is the fact that they went ahead and they like added, they would leave these saws, right? Like in, they would do the cutting. Yeah. Yeah. So they did this on purpose, 
right? It's like, I mean, I should have worn my holy jeans today, right? That I paid money to get with holes in them. <laughs> so same kind of, same kind of thing. And then um, if I click here, um, here's the, oh, and the next one is the inside. And then this is what Matt was talking about. Um, so this is one of the owls. Um, and um, you can see that it's around the corner, but we chose to inset it here. And this is one of the more stylized owls. And then inside, we decided to do this as a separate scene. These are the original schools, um, the original six schools of study available in 1936. Okay, so here's my favorite scene. Um, so here's Ernie Pyle um, and the statue that was created by Tuck Langland. And, um, and then if you click on it, you can actually see the photo on which the statue was based. Um, so again, that's not something you would have available to you in person. Um, so it's a way that you can sort of include extra information. Although we did learn from Tuck Langland um, that all of his statues, we also did Herman B. Wells, I think he did Hokey, um, um, are at 110% that he always blows up the size of the person. Although Ernie Pyle only weighed like, I don't know, like 120 pounds, 130 pounds. So we actually needed that 110%. I don't know if Herman B. Wells was super happy and needed it as well. Um, up here, um, this is really cool. So T.C. Steele was an Impressionist painter um, and was an artist in residence from 1923 to 1926. Um, and this was his art studio. Um, so again, this is something that doesn't exist anymore, but you can sort of see the history here. So I think we actually changed it so now it's off, right? So if I want the sound, here? Oh yeah, because I think, Oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, so okay, so it's quarter to five. Um, yeah, um, that was a good question, though, Bill. So we did. I think we finally decided that maybe it's a little distracting to have that on. Here's um, the inscription of a time capsule um, that's buried um, in this building um, with letters from Rockefeller and a list of women who donated to the building's construction. Um, as well as other historical ephemera. And then here's a historical photo. Um, and you'll notice that every, I haven't been rotating around, but every photosphere loads where it's automatically panning. And then this one, here's the patch. Um, so you can see the shadow of the tripod, even though the tripod is no longer here. So again, it depends on how much effort you want to put in. Not everyone removes their tripods, because they figure if you look down, um, from looking down, but we thought that because this was a partnership between us and the Indiana Geological and Water Survey that um, we would sort of put this on every single one. Um, and this one also has some of my favorite architectural details. So there's this um, serpent. There is um, a, a turret with bats and there is a grotesque. And do you remember what the rest? Unlike gargoyles, grotesques are decorative figures, not used as drain spouts. So, which is often something, I don't know how many times you say that and everybody's like, what? <laughs> I would guess every time you give the tour, huh? Um, most of us don't necessarily know the difference between gargoyles and grotesques. And we have many grotesques on campus, not many gargoyles. We have like, ah, okay, so no gargoyles. Um, so here, this is um, Owen Hall. Um, again, these are the original um, marks from the, the chisel marks from early limestone excavation. Um, and then um, they have the entry with the reclaimed bricks from when uh, campus was originally on Seminary Square. And then um, again, something that you can't see super well is there's this frieze of Persephone and Pan. And I think we might go back and make those bigger. They look like they're a little bit small. Um, so I know that's something we can adjust. Um, I think when you're in the VR headset, like it's not as small, but I still think it could be bigger. Um, so here's Wiley. And this is Wiley um, 
before the fire, and then here's Wiley on fire, <laughs> which again, um, so both being able to see it before it had a fire, right, which is not there in front of you, and then that historical photo taken when it was on fire. And then finally, Kirkwood Hall, um, we have the historical photo. Um, we have a detail here of a leaf carving. And then finally, um, we talk about the Kirkwood Observatory, which is sort of around the corner, but we've moved it a bit. So, yeah. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Do you want to like try it out in a headset? Okay, so the, que um, the question was, are we planning to expand the tour? And we had certainly made that available to the IG, WS <laughs> um, and um, do they just need to specify what stops they'd like us to add so yeah because obviously this only covers old campus um, and you know it'd be interesting to see what um, something like Luddy Hall looked like um, in comparison or even just expanding to some of the other places that they stopped like I said this is like a two and a half hour in-person tour and we didn't even get to all the stops that we went to um, when we did the in-person tour so Oh, so the question was, does Google have any recommendations on the ideal number of stops um, for or a duration um, of a tour? And they don't, but I think one of the things that we've noticed um, is that people get um, VR fatigue. And so you really do want to be um, aware, cognizant of the fact that a lot, most people don't spend their time with HMDs, even if it's your phone, in a Google Cardboard. Um, and that's where maybe giving people, though, if they have access to it, like, you know, if someone has, if you've got a classroom and you can come back to it more than once, um, but we found that 15 to 20 minutes seems to be actually the longest that most people want to spend. Um, when we've done other um, instances of these workshops, there are full HTC vibes in here, and I can't spend longer than 15 to 20 minutes in an HTC vibe, right, which is a full environment where I've got the headset on my face. Um, even when it was, we had this really cool one when I was doing, um, some of the historical applications and we had a you could dive and do the Titanic see the Titanic and the sort of it was a, they had included um, you know a piano that was recovered and all kinds of things but I just 15 minutes in I was kind of I was done any other questions yes Eric So I feel like there's an insert. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Is it possible to put these on a map? Um, so I think you put a static image, although I think they were talking about making it so that you could put a map in the beginning. So maybe that would be like, but once you're at a spot, like how do you get back to the map? Again, this, this is some of the limitations of using, there's advantages to using something that's simple, right? Is that you can easily pass the workflow on to others, um, et cetera. Oh, although there is, you'll notice that if I, if I look down, see right here is always gonna be distorted. So, and so for us, we we're like, eh, it's Indiana, it's in the edges of Indiana, it's the river being distorted, it'll be fine. Um, so, but you could, you could sort of say that you could put a map pretty consistently, but even then, like, I don't know about the hotspots, but they are expanding capability, like, as we speak, like, literally, Google Expeditions just opened up to tours, like, two weeks ago. So, um, this is something that is ongoing. Yeah. Yeah. So Matt can probably speak to the fact that um, I made him go back and recapture <laughs> a lot of photospheres. Um, and so, oh, so the question was, what kind of decisions did we have to make when capturing these? Um, and there's, I think there might be one that I'm still. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, so here, I think initially this one was taken with the sun on it, 
and the and the building was super washed out and it was really hard to see. Um, you can tell it is actually a pretty sunny day and some of this was time constraints in addition to weather. Um, but you know, so the sun is something that's really bright and can, is actually a, a real hindrance to 360 photography, especially if you're using something like a Rico, which is just stitching the front of that fisheye lens and the back of that fisheye lens. The fact that you have no control over that stitch um, what I noticed when I used it in New Mexico, which is of course famously sunny, is that the point of stitch, those stitches on those sides are actually pretty apparent. And um, glare is, actually, is also really apparent. Um, so, what? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scratch it. <laughs> um, so uh, the other thing that we really thought about and that Matt showed, um, and I think was really a great planning tool, um, is uh, this one, we had a spreadsheet where we planned out each capture so that he knew what kinds of points of interest and features and what was gonna go there so that he had that in mind as he went to do it. So we actually did a pre-tour, I think, where he captured everything with a Rico. We looked at it and then went back and made decisions so that when he went out with the Insta360, which is obviously much more expensive, heavier, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the things he didn't say is that while you can control it from a tablet, because it's a much more expensive camera, like realistically, how much, how far do you want to get from it in case somebody like grabs it and runs away from you? Um, so one of the tactics that Bernie Fisher used when he, um, he took some pictures um, at the Coliseum um, is he literally just, you know, so he sets it up and then he goes about 10 feet away and just looks like he's being like a studious person. <laughs> so he's actually in every single one of his photospheres as opposed to how we've done it. Um, so you could play like, where's Bernie? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really important. And then one of the other places that Matt was doing um, some of the IMU, because it's such an interesting building, but he was doing interior captures, but there's a lot of columns there. And so thinking about where to place the camera so that you have sort of the least obstruction from those various columns. And I think also your question really speaks to, um, so I'll promote Margaret is um, helping to facilitate uh, something at the end of the month um, with a cave cam that was pictures that were taken by some folks the cave cam is out of UC San Diego, but they're pictures of Luxor in Egypt. Um, and it's really cool because the pictures were taken um, actually on the eve of when things were heating up um, in Charrier Square. And so Luxor is actually as abandoned as it ever would be without closing it. Um, so you can talk about both the impacts of, you know, events like instability, political instability on tourism. And so maybe you're making access to something that people are not going to right now for safety reasons, or you're also capturing something as we know that, you know, ISIS has destroyed things. So you're capturing something that might possibly be destroyed. Um, but they had permission for the Egyptian government. And so it's, it's really fantastic um, what they were able to get. And the resolution on those captures, like I can't even, I just can't even, right? Like, <laughs> so you should, Yes, yeah, so they use something called a, gig, a gigapan and it has multiple mirrorless cameras on it, DSLR cameras. So the resolution is just incredible. And that'll be at the Scholars Commons on March 29th, um, the last Friday in March, in the afternoon, if anyone's interested. Any other questions? On April 3rd, in two weeks, we'll have an archaeology training session um, with folks um, from Illinois. Um, and I'm, re I'm really interested to sort of see what they're going to present. So, um, so please join us for that. All right. Great. Thanks.